Hi everyone, Mike Bianco, director of the Bunbury Regional Art Gallery. Uh, very excited today to be joined by Stuart Elliott, who is here to talk with us about uh, this fantastic ex exhibition that's up right now, Ingress. So Stuart, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I wanted to see if you would share with us a little bit of your own background, uh, kind of your foundations of art making and a little bit of the methods and things that you've been developing over the course of your career. Yeah, okay. I, um, I grew up in the, uh, in the bush, um, and well, it was bush in those days, it's uh, mm. Gooseberry Hill. It's a uh, much more posh area these days, it's been gentrified. But in those days it was uh, gravel on bare feet and bushfires. And um, there were kind of, I suppose, the, the beginnings of the, um, the emblem of Western Australia, which was, uh, there were gravel pits and clay pits. And I was really crook as a, as a kid, uh, missed a lot of school. So I used to read a lot and I used to go off um, just exploring by myself and just got really interested in clay. Be, mm. I mean, you can do a lot of stuff with clay. It's probably one of the oldest and paradoxically one of the most enduring of, of um, art media that humans have ever been involved with. School of Art first and uh, that was very much a place about making mm. and um, it, it was I suppose by contemporary standards it was pretty hokey a very broad kind of catchment um, kind of interesting lecturers uh, a couple of them were real standouts Tony Jones is mm. a classic um, and uh, we just did lots of kind of interesting kind of projects and um, when I entered, went to art school I just said ah oh, I've got lots of brilliant ideas, I'm really clever, I just need a bit of technique. And uh, after three years at Claremont, it was like, I know nothing. Mm. <laughs> so I applied to um, Curtin University, which was Waite in those days, and got into their degree course and, and did uh, two years there. And um, kind of supported myself working in holidays as a sparky. Um, but at the end of that, I got a uh, job with um, with a spare parts th puppet theatre as a designer and a builder. Mm. Um, the, the really important issue um, about uh, weight was um, just kind of working out where to go, um, what was important. I mean, it was the high summer of, um, uh, of modernism. And I remember watching it at, 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 uh, one of the, the many shows on the ABC about contemporary art and um, Robert Hughes, um, just um, really bunging on with people like Chagall and whatever. And I think uh, Geoffrey Smart got a one-liner. He was a stiff but competent um, draftsman. And I have immense respect for, for Robert Hughes, but I was a little perplexed that, that someone could be dismissed because um, Smart to me really, really talked about the, the human urban condition mm. in a way which was really kind of transcendent. Um, and this was years before I discovered people like, uh, like Eric Fischel and, and um, whatever. That's kind of where I was. Um, I didn't paint for a long time or I didn't, I didn't show anybody for a long time because uh, I was always self-conscious about the way that I painted. But it was very, very representational mm. um, in a world which was much more interested in style. And um, I remember one of the first shows I curated, um, one of the artists I included in it, looked at me in a very quizzical way and said, why, why do you choose to paint like that? I think, well, that's the way that I paint. It's mm. not a choice. It's a way of actually trying to, trying to understand the world with, in using a two-dimensional kind of vehicle. When is it that you start developing, I don't even want to call it a style, mm -hmm. but one of the things I'm really excited about with your practice is it's, it's driven by this kind of core method, this kind of, I don't want to call it a framework or a structure because that seems a bit heavy handed, but it seems like early on you kind of gave yourself a way of working to create the things that you make and the images and objects you produce. Could you talk a bit about, about that development and this concept that I don't want to name because I'm going to leave it to you to say? <laughs> yeah, um, it was when, in my degree year at um, Curtin and I was really looking for 
some kind of real vehicle to take me somewhere to get those ideas and, and stuff together. And so it was a high summer of, of modernism, so everything was about kind of formal issues. I remember we went to school camp and um, into a place close to Nanup, and the lecturers were sort of talking about the wonderful relationship between the sky and the verticality of the trees. And you think, this place has been strip mined and then they put plantations of pine in there. You can't drink the water. It looks like a really a, a bubbling stream, but it's so saline you can't drink it. Um, but and you'd kind of where you'd walk around the fire breaks, it's beautiful sort of fungi, you know, squash flat with the four wheel drives of, of um, the, the people that were, were um, were running the camp. And it just sort of struck me as that, that there was a total kind of lack of regard for the, the actual existential world that we live in. It was all kind of art seemed to be happening out there somewhere, a refined um, thing. And, I, and it, it just, that just didn't do it for me. I had real trouble with empathy. Um, and I, during that time, I went and, and used to go to the gallery quite often, State Gallery. And they had a, a whole collection of um, oceanic and African art. And uh, that stuff really resonated. It was really sophisticatedly put together, but in a way which didn't look glib or, or, or slick. Big towering kind of three-dimensional works that when you walked around them, they were three-dimensional works. The front was not the same as the sides or the, uh, or the, or the back. Whereas a lot of the stuff that, that was being promulgated is um, the, the, the kind of, this is, this is where we go. Um, and I quite like Clement Mead, Mead more, but there's got to be more to it than that. You walk, all your re only reason you walk around a, a work like that is to confirm what you believe to be on the other side. Mm -hmm. Whereas this Africa and Oceanic stuff really kind of talked about not just the unpredictability of, of the form, but the context in which it came from. And you know, people talk about, oh well, you know, you don't, they don't have such a thing as art. You know, it's it's all part of the culture. And you think, well, they're just semantics. You know, it's a it's a, an existence which is really intricately woven with with ways of doing things. But you kind of look at one of those um, um, f uh, figures like a Benin head, and you can't tell me that the person that that modelled that and cast it and then fettled it. Um, didn't have a, a pursuit of, of formal excellence. It didn't stand back and go, gee, that worked out okay. Mm. You know, it was not just a, a kind of prop for ritual. These things themselves were, were real kind of almost like ganglia. Um, so I just thought, oh, I'm gonna start experimenting with that. And, and a lot of the ideas that, that um, were involved with the, the uh, um, African Oceanic work, the so-called primitive work, because a lot of South American stuff as well. Um, there was just something really quite um, um, interesting about it in the way that, that the, the forms themselves really also um, were, were concerned with the materials that they were made of. And there was lots of residences. And the one that I think that really did it for me, I was reading this thing where um, there was uh, the, the, the idea of uh, um, a, a fetish figure. So a shaman would commission someone to make this figure. And then the shaman would consecrate it. And you know, the whole thing about, yeah, it's got the hole in the belly and they put the pus and the blood in there with the mirror. And that goes into a box and a, a reliquy kind of. Um, and then that goes into a hut and this thing's got so much juice, people not only wouldn't go into the hut, they wouldn't go near the hut. This thing became this real kind of generator of, of like, um, there's something bigger than all of you out there. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of made me think about, um, on the one hand, a police station, you know, you just you wouldn't go and piss on the fence of a police station. You just wouldn't do it. Why? It's no different to mm -hmm. a fence uh, at, at a shop down the road. But it's about that kind of sense of, of, of almost a soft dread, like some things you just don't fiddle with. Mm -hmm. And manners are kind of attached a little bit to that. Social protocols are attached a little bit to that. Um, but on the other hand, um, you look at a, a beautiful big cathedral and the stuff that's in there, um, there's kind of like this containers within containers within containers, and all of them form this kind of real resonance. So, you know, when you see images of 
of churches being desecrated or bombed or, or whatever. There's something really awful about that because it actually talks about almost torpedoing part of the core of, our, of, our, um, of ourselves uh, as a species. So I built this, uh, this form, which is a, a figure, uh, which was like a, a, um, a, a police figure, a martial figure, like a riot cop or whatever. And uh, I made a, a special container for him and because um, I made two of them, a girl one and a boy one, and um, made sure it was kept closed because that was kind of part of the concept. And uh, I was already impressed that the first thing <laughs> anyone would ever do was haul the door open. Yeah, what's going on in there? Mm -hmm. And you think, like, yeah, we're, we have come a long way from that, that kind of um, space. So I started working out how you might make those sorts of containers and put, put things in them which, which had some kind of juice. And then after a while I just kind of worked through that and the figures and the implements and stuff started to, be, to, to get into the real world to escape from their original kind of, um, yeah, their, their containers. Um, and I also wanted to make a connection between the, the um, the way that something looks and what it is, um, like saying about Disneyland, that you know you, you slap that that turret and it is it's made of granite, made of masonry. Um, it's not fiberglass. So the idea of actually making things that where the material and its meaning became really integral. I mean, 20 years later you you learn about words like essentialism and nexus and all that sort of stuff. So. It's been with us for a long time, but somehow it gets kind of like diluted and lost in translation. I just wanted to get back to that. And the other thing was, I guess, I just, I've never really wanted to make just art, you know, something which is kind of decor, which is um, you know, an amusing thing to have on the wall or something of that nature. But they, to me, they've all got to have, have some resonant meaning because I think for much of art, if they don't mean anything important to the artist, it's a big ask to think it's something important to somebody else. Mm. And you know, I guess there's, there's interesting kind of contradictions like that all over the place. Um, but that's kind of where I came from. So even with works like this one, um, and you know, the, the whole essentialist thing falls down a bit because you know, they're not, no, they're not bowls. It's all, all made out of wood. But it's also kind of a reference to these, these containers um, because we really don't know what those containers are in. Uh, and that's kind of a little bit related to when um, I used to, I started to teach. And I, I rode bikes for about 40 years or so. And um, the, the bigger they're and the faster the better. Um, and there was a, a, a a road which had opened up between where I lived and where I worked, just lecturing a couple of days a week. And um, there was a couple of um, abattoirs, um, which I think one of them was fantastic euphemism. It was a protein recovery um, installation. And the other one was just like something out of um, Razorback. It, it looked like nothing could ever come in there and come out better. And they had these three big um, silos, which presumably c contained tallow and that sort of stuff. And um, again, it just kind of struck me as that, that notion between, or that, that tension between the, uh, an assumed anonymity of a container, but the contextual kind of resonances which can make it look either mysterious or, or kind of sinister. And um, that idea of the, the of the container and its relationship to that which is contained has stayed with me for a long time. Mm. Architecture is a really good, good example of that, um, that you, you're kind of never too sure what goes on inside some buildings. Mm. Um, and there, there are images in, that, um, in the 2D stuff which kind of uh, also um, convey. <music> This particular one, um, I actually did it for uh, to enter a um, um, an award uh, up in Joondalup, and um, 
it's always been a real um, close to my heart, I guess, because I, you know, I was a volunteer fireman for, for 10 years or so. And there was always something really thrilling when you're kind of all suited up and you get in the truck and you're full speed towards something like that. It just, yeah, it's a, it's a rush which nothing other than a motorcycle could give you. Because <laughs> you just don't know what's going to be over there. Hmm. Um, so there's that kind of sense of that, like, um, Im impending excitement, but you just don't know. It could go past, the wind could change, you just don't know. And with these um, boxes too, um, are they kind of dishevelled? Are they, they there, ready to do something? Or are they just being discarded? The, the flag there um, is from one of the first of these buildings, series of buildings, uh, which exist in the other works, uh, called a facility. And I just like the name, the facility, because it, it, it's such a non-specific word. It doesn't let you know what's going on inside there other than something important. Um, and the reason, I guess, one of the re big reasons that um, you, know, you see the smoke being a bit discoloured, so you really don't know how close that fire is, um, was I had a beautiful rescue dog, um, a dog called Rex, and uh, he, um, Al Alsatian Wolfhound Cross, and uh, after a marriage busted up, um, it was just me and Rex left uh, on a big property up, up in the, the, the bush. And um, I used to take him wherever I could. And um, I was starting to court my now partner of 15 years, Sue, about that time. And um, on the way home, um, I had, had Rex with me and I stopped at a bottle shop and came out. And the sun was just kind of going down. It was a really nasty kind of um, stormy um, winter day. And I just loved that sky. And I just thought, I've got to do something with that sky. And uh, later on, I, I made a, a really significant um, collage involving the, the, this part of this painting and um, a much more ominous sky and um, Rex walking up towards an upper, upper set of stairs, which are from the, the Homes of Court Gallery where I did a residency. And it, it just every now and again you make something which you think like that, that's a, a personally very important work. Formally it really goes and there's just enough in it to suggest that there's something going on. Hmm. And it's not a narrative but it's like a chunk of a narrative from somewhere. Um, anyway, um, I buried Rex about, about seven years ago. Um, but this painting is almost like a, it stands as a kind of testament to him, which is why it's called Requiem. There's something about, um, yeah, that there's a sense of kind of, of loss, but also a sense of impending and radical change. Mm. And as it turned out with Sue, it was a really fantastic change. So Stuart, one of the things I'm really excited about with your work and your practice are the objects that you make. And so you were talking a bit about um, working in the puppet theater and you were talking about your time in California and you even mentioned Disneyland. And you know, one of the things that I'm so drawn to in your work is the kind of forms of miniature, the notions of theater, um, and also the tremendous intricacy of all the things that you make and the materials that you explore. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about that and then a bit a bit uh, about this idea that you have presented about this notion of fakeology. This particular work um, is probably one of the latest um, iterations of it. just got really interested in board games. Mm -hmm. I've always loved board games. And there's something quite, um, I don't know, interesting about um, combat struggle opposition being reduced to these really quite formal elements, um, almost like art being reduced to formal elements. Um, so this work is kind of about, um, it, it, it is based on a board game of, of my own invention, and it's about a very strong asymmetric um, struggle. Um, now I talked a little bit before about essentialism too, about those, the, the um, um, truth of materials and that sort of stuff. That's also really quite plastic, and <clears throat> and one of the um, the things that I 
or inevitably do, I won't buy new materials unless I really have to. And it's not because um, I'm, I'm mean. It's often things that have already had a life have got a certain kind of resonance to mm -hmm. them. So a lot of these, these, these buildings here, um, they're um, constructed from um, recycled furniture, from um, some uh, um, verge collection sort of stuff. Um, broken down and, and kind of fabricated. Um, and this particular struggle, uh, the, the game itself of being adversarial, is about um, these the, the forces of, of, of order, if you will. Um, I mean, the whole thing about map making was like, if, if the coloniser can reduce a complex um, ecosystem of massive of different societies um, into a flat plane, it's much less threatening and it's much easier to divide up. And the, the notion at the moment that, that, you know, development is king, everything has to be kind of like developed. Um, I'm not a lot of it. I, I, I think that development um, is inevitable. There's too many people and not enough space. But there's kind of ways of doing things. And the idea of actually constructing endless and endless and endless acreages of dog boxes charging an arm and leg for them on the most arable land in, the, in the, this part of the continent and brick paving it, I just find really quite absurd. So this is kind of a march of those things and these, um, the, the billboards talking about um, you know, the, the new Nirvana, the products. And these structures here, again, they're, they're um, most of the, the, um, the, the carved elements are from um, a recycled pallet wood. And like these structures here, that um, the, the barriers, they're all again uh, recycled nails from the, the offcuts that I've made a lot of these buildings and stuff out of, and use the offcuts for firewood, mm. and pull the nails out of the fire and, and straighten them and shape them. Mm. The the ba um, base itself is actually made out of um, uh, out of welded steel, and. Again, um, recycled plywood and machined up uh, timber. Um, this bit is a, a kind of an anachronism because this work was originally um, designed for, uh, or yeah, constructed for a Duchamp homage show, although it's based on, the, on a sentiment which is still with us, still contemporary. Um, and so to that, that's you know, Duchamp's bottle rack, um, the, the um, the key um, fixing underneath there is modelled after his chocolate grinder, and the um, the structure on top here um, after Man Ray's they're pretty pally uh, flat iron, um, and the fact that this is like a judge's chair sitting what's supposed to be impartially um, dividing up so everyone gets a fair shake mm. um, kind of isn't the judge isn't even there the judge has gone done a runner. Uh, and even if the judge was here, it would be really awkward to sit on and get and, and that close to it. Um, and so that the iron itself, which is made out of um, uh, timber, um, again, because it's talking about um, absurdity, um, the idea of actually making a flat iron, which originally cast iron out of wood, I kind of like that idea. Mm. Yeah. And and what about this idea, your, your notion of fakeology that you've talked about? How What is that and how does that tie into the construction of a work like this? Well, it, it kind of, the, the, the underlying thing is to kind of suggest that, that um, what I make is, uh, is a residue, if you will, of a, um, the remnants um, of a, um, a bygone um, civilization, which runs parallel to ours, or has run parallel to ours. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we, we've kind of made is, is richly metaphoric of itself, like, like the flat iron. Um, you know, compared to the, the, um, the, uh, the almost the hovercraft numbers you use these days, these were really kind of hard work to use. Mm. Um, but in their day, they were the, the, the kind of the rich metaphor. If you had one of those, you'd made it. You know, you were, you were highly civilised. So the idea of actually using structures like that to suggest that they are, you know, like funerary um, offerings or like all the shabti and, and the boats and stuff from pharaonic tombs 
I kind of like that. No one ever thought that they would actually f literally float in the real world. They were built in a way to, to convey the essence of the craft, the essence of the meaning. And fakeology is actually kind of talking about that by using recognisable forms as a, um, a vehicle, a, a metaphor for, um, for meanings which basically they work as a conduit for meaning from that world to this world so that they kind of hopefully like the the riot cop in the box uh, and the fetish figure in the in the uh, african hunt uh, hut that they there is a kind of common meaning mm. if you if you can look for it on the other hand um sometimes just to make something you enjoy making and to make it the best that you possibly can um is also a kind of form of seduction so that if someone wants to know more, in a way, there's a reason for, for looking further into it, if the objects are interesting enough and not entirely self-explanatory. The exhibition is anchored with this really beautiful and quite elaborate, uh, dare I call it a sculpture or an installation. I mean, could you tell us a bit about this work and its history and its place within the show? It, it kind of lent its, um, or it informed the naming of the show. Because this one, it was made during a, a, a fairly um, um, a trying time in my life and, and trying to work out which which way to go. Um, again, you're never really given a kind of a, a plan as to um, how things are going to work out. Um, you, you sort of have to use a lot of in instinct, common sense and intuition. And this work kind of started to kind of like give some substance to those sorts of quandaries. And in its way, it was actually quite, to me, an important work because it, it was kind of talking about um, a, a kind of formal and organised existence. On the other hand, it was actually also talking about an organic and, and, and kind of risky existence. And you, you kind of, in a way, you've got to do both. I mean, you've got to, you've got to pay rates. Um, you've got to make enough um, to, to live. But on the other hand, if you don't have, have an unpredictability or a, or a kind of like a wildness, it's a difference between having a life to me and, and an existence. But the two are uh, inevitably um, in conflict. They, they just don't cohabitate that well. And the causeway was kind of a way of actually talking about a connection between that kind of or organic, the chaotic, and the kind of formal or the functional. And I, I wanted the, the, um, the idea of the, the, the causeway to look like it is this kind of, on the surface of it, an easy connection between the two, a way of getting above whatever the pr problem of the earth was, or the terrain in between these two existences. Um, but in actual fact, the, the causeway itself, although it, it looks like it's a, a, you know, a paragon of efficiency, I mean, every pillar's got a hole in the roof and uh, in, the, in the, the top of it, and they're all aligned in such a way that if you're moving f across the causeway, you have to be very, if someone wants, they have to be very, very careful. The idea of these things being, in a sense, almost like um, a setup of games or diagrams or a way of, of the maker trying to understand the world. Hmm. And the, that game was also along those lines. It was actually, it was almost like s some person or persons unknown had constructed it to see if they could get a handle on, on where they were. And in this situation, I'm also kind of like regarding it as being kind of quite temporal, that you know this could be a future, and that could be a past. Mm. But then there's no reason to believe that that's just a kind of a finite thing. In actual fact, they might be two sides of the same coin. That if you were to extend it, there might be another one of those over that way, and there might be another one over. Uh, over that way, because we seem to do that a lot, um, be able to to build these really rich and sophisticated um, societies, 
at the same time planting kind of mines in them. So inevitably they fail. Um, every empire fails, every civilization fails. It's always had a place in my heart. There's always something very special about it. And so many of the works in here are actually informed by, um, by Bunbury, but um, a lot also about the, um, the incredible gravitational um, force that, that, that the Horn Collection has had on, uh, on me. They've often acquired really quite difficult, curatorially difficult works, and that's always fantastic when your work goes into a good collection. But more importantly, if they're difficult works, it's like a almost a, tar a, a tacit endorsement that you're not you're not doing bad things. You're not wasting your time. <laughs> there is someone that actually takes it seriously. Mm. So this work again is terribly important for it, for its representation in the show. And these two I did a uh, residency in Edinburgh, and this was work which was done before the residency and this work, uh, and the, the big commission was done after it. And then this one, the, the comet of course was, was this year. So not unlike the causeway, it's actually talking about those temporal links across time. Mm. It, it, it's, it's not too, too tautological, but it's that kind of idea of a, of a continuum that all things are sort of connected. Mm. Lovely, amazing. Well. Thank you so much for uh, presenting your work with Bragg. It's a real honor to have you in the gallery. And uh, I hope for all of you that you'll be able to come to the exhibition and uh, celebrate this incredible show uh, with Bragg. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.